This is Duke University. Thank you. I had to thank Professor Burton for the wonderful introduction. It is quite a distance. Uh, <laughs> and before I say anything else, I have to um, confess that um, I just arrived from California, so it's really early in the morning for me. <laughs> It is a great honor to have been invited to participate in this symposium, which explores the myriad intellectual legacies of John Hope Franklin. So I would like to specifically thank the Volia Glem, Tommy de France, and all of the organizers of the symposium. It has, um, it's really wonderful and a privilege to join Drew Faust and Lorna Simpson, uh, whom we'll hear later today, and Saidia Hartman, whom I'm uh, really looking forward to hearing tomorrow morning, as well as Rod Ferguson and all of the other amazing uh, panel uh, presenters. Uh, and I always love coming to Duke because it means I get to see Juanima Lubiano. <laughs> John Hope Franklin was not only a preeminent historian in the sense of having made pioneering contributions to the field, he made it impossible within the field of producing histories of the United States, indeed also of the Americas, he made it impossible uh, uh, to uh, imagine the production of histories that did not account for the pivotal role of people of African descent. He also promoted a kind of popular historical consciousness that was central to uh, the development of anti-racist movements, not only central to the development of African American studies and other academic fields, uh, but um, uh, to movements uh, from the 1960s on. In other words, who we are and who we think we are collectively and individually is in no small measure due to the intellectual gifts of John Hope Franklin. As for myself, I cannot imagine having experienced uh, uh, what I experienced and having my own life unfold the way it did in the absence of from slavery to freedom. I'm not sure how many of you are old enough, maybe a few, uh, but not more than a few, to uh, remember the period predating the establishment of black studies programs when from slavery to freedom and Du Bois's black reconstruction were the, the central texts that we relied on, both within and outside um, of the academy. And this was regardless of our disciplinary training. From slavery to freedom. The theme of this symposium, um, Global slaveries, impossible freedoms, complicates the categories around which John Hope Franklin's intellectual scholarship and activism was, cre was crafted. So I would like to share with you a recent moment that this theme evoked for me. Last May, I was invited by the city of Nantes in France to participate in ceremonies marking the relationship of France to the global slave trade. Uh, they have established uh, since, 19, since 2012, I believe, what they call a Journée Nationale des Mémoires 
de la traite, de l'esclavage et de leur abolition. The National Day of Remembrance of the Slave Trade, Slavery and Their Abolition, which is observed every year on May 10th. First of all, it's actually quite amazing that, uh, that France has such a day and the US has not even begun to think about a national day of remembrance. And it seems that the only time we are engaged in widespread popular discussions of slavery is in relation to a new film, which I won't go into. <laughs> But in France, um, and in Nantes in particular, thanks in part to the role of Françoise uh, Vergès, there is uh, an impressive memorial to slavery and the slave trade um, in the center of the city of Nantes. And every year, over the last uh, uh, three years, on May 10th, there is a ceremony that involves throwing flower petals into the Loire and uh, remembering um, uh, the slave trade and slavery. The memorial was inaugurated on, uh, in the spring of 2012 uh, uh, following the adoption by the city of Nantes on the 150th anniversary of the abolition of slavery, the idea of constructing a monument along uh, uh, the Fosse uh, 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 in uh, on the Loire. Now, the memorial to slavery not only commemorates the victims of the Atlantic slave trade, but it it acknowledges the struggles uh, and the battles against slave trades and, and, and slavery all over uh, the world. Along the quay, uh, uh, there, there are about 7,000 meters of walkways uh, uh, on which or in which are embedded approximately 2,000 glass plaques named after the ships, the slave ships that uh, 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 were, uh, that were in, whose voyages were initiated uh, in Nantes. Uh, the dates, the expeditions, uh, uh, the slave colonies, the, the, the trade ports. And then from the Esplanade, there's a an open air staircase that leads down to an underground passageway, uh, which is where the main core of the memorial is situated. And one sees, I, I, I wish I had brought some uh, photographs, uh, uh, but there are um, um, quotations from uh, people, literary scholars, uh, activists, uh, historians uh, around the world in um, uh, personal accounts and songs and abolition uh, texts. Uh. And this is framed by the word freedom, which is displayed in some 50 different languages. Uh. But of course, memorials are always a little tricky in the sense that they can occasion forgetfulness and amnesia even as they invite us to engage in these exercises of historical memory. And so this last year, after we had thrown the rose petals into the Loire and walked along the path marked by the glass plaques bearing the names of some 2,000 slave ships, we approached the podium where the official ceremony was to take place. The crowd was largely white French, and they had gathered to hear a black gospel group perform and to listen to the mayor's words. 
I noticed that there was a silent demonstration in process. Standing on the perimeter of the audience was a group of black men holding placards. And I remember seeing one of them in particular, uh, which read, Aucun être humain n'est illégal. No human being is illegal. And another one demanded action from the mayor. Uh, as it turned out, they were refugees from Africa who had been recently evicted uh, from the, the place they had been uh, staying, and they were um, housed at that point in a church. But I can say that in my brief talk, I couldn't ignore their powerful, silent presence. And I felt compelled to acknowledge that the men standing there as a, were there as a reminder that remembering slavery and the slave trade is not only or not even primarily about remembering the past. And of course, last night, Drew Foss repeated the often repeated quote from Faulkner, the past is not dead, it is not even past. Uh, I thought about the past insisting on being acknowledged in its very presence when I realized that these men, refugees from various countries in Africa who had made their way across the Mediterranean to Nantes, had retrace the voyages of the slave trade from Nantes, but in reverse. And later, when I met with them um, at the church that had given them temporary refugees, one of them repeated um, several times, uh, the Mediterranean is an African graveyard. The Mediterranean is an African graveyard. And so global slavery's impossible freedoms. These are complicated times. Over the last year and a half since the protest in Ferguson, which incidentally continue to take place, or at least I was last there in June and the protests were continuing. But we have achieved a broad public consciousness regarding the persistence of the same racist state violence about which John Hope Franklin voiced so many concerns. The organizers of this symposium have pushed us to follow Franklin's lead and to think capaciously and globally. As we ask why the world responded so passionately to the killings of Mike Brown, Eric Garner, and the many others, uh, whom we have learned about uh, this last year, which isn't to say that this is the first year that so many uh, killings have happened. Of course, we know uh, uh, that what is different is the, the, are the responses and the, and the media coverage. Uh, uh, and some of the cases involve um, Sandra Bland, of course, and the recent South Carolina attack on a young schoolgirl by a school resource officer. But if we ask why the world has responded so passionately, the answer must have something to do with the way in which these technologies of violence have become increasingly familiar to people throughout the world. A schoolgirl is assaulted by a police officer in South Carolina for using her cell phone in class. A young Muslim boy in the banlieue outside of Paris refuses to say, je suis Charlie, and he is told by his teacher that if, if he is not Charlie, then he must be a terrorist. This young boy was actually arrested by the police. The millions of deterritorialized people in Africa and the Middle East who are now fleeing to Europe represents um, something like the revenge of history. Uh, um, uh, in 
this post-colonial era, we cannot um, think about uh, these uh, uh, massive, uh, the, this massive exodus, except in response to processes that were uh, initiated uh, by colonialism. Uh, but here in the US, we tend to think about that as a European problem. Uh, uh, and why do we not also recognize the role that the US has played in creating the conditions that have uh, led so many millions of people to leave home? Our historical amnesia is so complete that we fail to acknowledge the role that the US played in dislodging populations in Afghanistan uh, and, 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 and Libya. So how do we make sense of these global developments? How can John Hope Franklin's deep engagement with history and his engagement as a public intellectual, and I really like the quotation that's included in the program, I think knowing one's history leads one to act in a more enlightened fashion. I cannot imagine how knowing one's history would not urge one to be an activist. And so how can John Hope Franklin's deep engagement with history and his engagement as a public intellectual, as an activist, help us to negotiate these complicated times when freedoms appear to be even more impossible than when slaveries were on the verge of being dismantled. I want to suggest that we take seriously his role as an activist in the same way we take seriously his role as an academic historian. I want to ask, what can we learn about how to negotiate the current crises in such a way that might accelerate our efforts to purge our societies of the damaging effects of racism. In an interview in 1998, Manning Marable said to John Hope Franklin, you've gone through this experience with the initiative, he's referring to President Clinton's initiative on race. You've studied the life and historical experience of the African-American people. What we've had to confront in this country fundamentally is a system of racial inequality. Can racism be dismantled in this country based on your experience? How optimistic are you that we can one day triumph over racism? This was Manning's question. Um, and Franklin's response, uh, I am cautiously optimistic. But if I were not optimistic, I would, have, I would jump out of the window or something because I couldn't stand it. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I believe, he said, in the redemption of man, the rehabilitation of man. I believe that it is entirely possible to overcome the awful, awful difficulties we've had in this country. I think it will take a long time and I'm willing to fight for the long haul. The historian is not of the opinion that this will happen in his lifetime. And we need more historians among us. A more historical-minded people among us. Uh, uh, this, is in, uh, this, this is an interview that I think was originally published in Souls and is included in uh, Dispatches from the Ebony Tower. I think we need this far-reaching optimism. On the one hand, of course, uh, John Hope Franklin argued for more historians, and I know that he must be smiling wherever he is in acknowledgement of the many, many brilliant historians, uh, Robin D.G. Kelly, Tara Hunter, uh, Sarah Haley, Craig Wilder, and all of the other amazing participants in this symposium, but also those in other fields who have critically engaged with history, like Saidiya Hartman, who has radically changed the way we think about slavery. I think he must certainly be smiling. But I wonder how far he might think we have come with respect to his call for 
more historical-minded people, for a historical consciousness that urges us to break through the strictures of what Frederick Jameson called the disappearance of a sense of history, the way in which our entire contemporary social system has little by little begun to lose its capacity to retain its past, has begun to live in a perpetual present and in a perpetual change that obliterates traditions of the kind which all earlier social formations have, have had in one way or another to preserve. Historians have reminded us that we are often, that we are produced by processes that often relegate us as individuals to relative insignificance. Each time I think about the ways John Hope Franklin was belittled by the failures of the same history of which he was a student, I feel the need to remind myself of, of the need for what he called a historical-minded people. Uh, within months of having received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1995, um, Franklin was confronted by a woman in a New York hotel lobby who asked him to uh, dispose of her garbage because uh, she mistook him as custodial help. Uh, and then he also talked about being mistaken in a hotel in um, Tulsa for a bellhop and being asked to carry a stranger's luggage. And then he said, I laugh. I laugh at most of these people. How can you take them seriously? <laughs> but he also said, I wish I could see what their eyes see. Here's an old man with a nice suit on, no uniform, no accoutrements of servitude. I'd like to understand what it is. I'm 82 years old and they still see me as a boy. The persistence of these day-to-day -day indignities that are familiar to most African Americans stem from the longevity uh, of, of slavery. Uh, Franklin uh, said, without ending slavery, you couldn't end the idea that black people were inferior. People still see me as someone meant to serve. That's a bad way to be in a country that's supposed to be based on the premise that all men are equal. The sense of history carried by Franklin from his academic to his activist work implies an array of questions whose answers prove increasingly elusive, the most overarching of which is the question of freedom. Since the role of slavery in the making of our contemporary worlds has hardly been resolved. Why is there a tendency to read Franklin's masterwork so literally and so superficially from slavery to freedom as if slavery were a discrete institution that can be comfortably relegated to a past which has been overcome in the one-dimensional freedom of the post-slavery era? Just as John Hope Franklin shared anecdotes about the racist politics of perception which often transformed him into a servant, probably every single one of us who has been perceived to be of African descent has similar anecdotes that lead us to realize how significant we are against the, backdrops of the, against the backdrop of the failures of history. Um, 
Perhaps Hegel was correct. History is progress in the consciousness of freedom, but not necessarily progress in the externalization of freedom. Franklin's call for a historical-minded people, both because of its um, contemporary resonance and because Franklin himself attempted to help generate uh, this uh, historical consciousness uh, is, is extremely important. Uh, uh, he was, as we know, the chair of the Presidential Initiative on Race created by Bill Clinton in 1997. In the commencement address that Clinton gave at the University of California, San Diego in June of 1997, he asserted that he was planning, Bill Clinton, that is, to lead the American people in a great and unprecedented conversation about race. Yeah. <laughs> I could make further comments, but I will simply say that people who had followed Clinton's nomination of Lonnie Guineer to head the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, and of course his subsequent withdrawal of the nomination, are aware that it was Lonnie Guineer who had initially proposed such a national conversation on race. In 1995, she had said, quote, we need a national conversation on race. We need new thinking and new approaches to race and racism that move beyond notions of intentional acts of bigotry and prejudice, beyond the claims of legal racial equality that rallied the civil rights movement in the 1960s, beyond the notion that racial preferences are the only or best way to remedy inequality, away from the claims based on individual guilt and individual um, innocence. Uh, uh, as uh, John Hartigan uh, Jr. pointed out in his book, which covers uh, uh, that, uh, that year, it's called What Can You Say, America's National Conversation on Race. Uh, um, he pointed out that Franklin lamented from the outset that it was clear that the media defined conversation on race as a debate. And so if there were no fireworks, there was clear evidence that nothing of importance was being accomplished. Uh, uh, and this is a quote from Hertigan, the expectations around racial stories were clearly, as they remain today, associated with clashes and disputes. What I'm suggesting is that um, Franklin's role, John Hope Franklin's role in this unfortunately failed national conversation on race holds lessons regarding how such conversations might be conducted today. First of all, I appreciate his conscious decision not to invite figures such as Ward Connolly into the conversation who were of course, around that time, attempting to undo affirmative action programs in California and elsewhere. Franklin and his colleagues were trying to establish parameters for a conversation that would not deteriorate into a shouting match about the contemporary relevance of race. Those who wanted to undercut the very premise of the conversation were simply not invited, which made a lot of sense. He did not want a debate, he wanted a deep engagement with the ways in which slavery and colonization have shaped our lives. Uh, for those who remember, you'll remember that no native person was on the commission. And I impress, I'm impressed with um, the patience with which uh, uh, John Hope Franklin dealt with this. Uh, I'm sure he would be very happy to read Craig Wilder's Ebony and Ivory, 
ebony and ivy, which insists that it is uh, impossible to tell the story of slavery and higher education in this country without also telling the story of colonization and First Nations people. Needless to say, regardless of the heroic efforts of John Hope Franklin, who became the target of many critiques, uh, the conversation never reached fruition. Uh, and then, of course, there was the small matica, matter of the Monica Lewinsky. Uh, <laughs> but, but perhaps that conversation was doomed to fail from the outset, not in the least because it was assumed that a year of conversation would prepare the way for Clinton's One America. The assumption that, they were, that black people were on one side, white people were on the other. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, the, the black-white paradigm uh, uh, prevailed then. And all that needed to happen was to reconcile black and white. Uh, but there was also the assumption that this conversation would help to heal a nation that had spent the previous 130 years ignoring the profound injuries inflicted on, inflicted on individuals and communities by the institution of slavery. John Hope Franklin never failed to emphasize the extent to which slavery remained a living force. Uh, Of course, Franklin's analysis of slavery and the analysis uh, that many others have uh, offered us uh, have helped those of us who have been involved for the last 30 years or so in the prison abolition struggle. Uh, and recently I was in um, Maryland, uh, in, uh, Mar in St. Mary's City, uh, which was the um, first colonial settlement in 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 Mar Maryland, and behind the state house at the back of the old state house, the reconstructed state house, I saw reminders that jails and prisons, which um, we tend to see as permanent features of our society. It's interesting that we think about slavery as having uh, uh, withered away, but we think about jails and prisons uh, in terms of a permanence that stretches far into the future. But I saw, I saw uh, the stocks and the pillory, the old forms of uh, uh, punishment that should remind us that if they were superseded, uh, along with other forms of corporal punishment as routine aspects of quotidian life, then jails and prisons might also be considered impermanent. Uh, uh, last spring, the New York Times published an editorial, or not an editorial, it was actually an extended article, an extended upshot analysis that was entitled 1.5 missing uh, black men. And it opened with these observations. In New York, almost 120,000 black men between the ages of 25 and 54 are missing from everyday life. In Chicago, 45,000 are, and more than 30,000 are missing in Philadelphia. Across the South, from North Charleston, South Carolina, <clears throat> excuse me, through Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi, and into Ferguson, Missouri, hundreds of thousands more are missing. They are missing largely because of early deaths or because, of, because they are behind bars. Remarkably, black women who are 25 to 54 and not in jail outnumber black men in that category by 1.5 million. For every 100,000 black women in this age group living outside of jail. There are only 83 black men. Among whites, the equivalent number is 99 near parity. The report emphasizes that more than one out of every six black men who should be between the ages of 25 and 54 are missing 
from daily life. They have suffered death by violence or civil death by imprisonment. And the fact that the death penalty continues to be used as a routine form of punishment. Uh, the only real questions revolving around the death penalty being the most, around the most humane death producing chemicals. Uh, this can only be explained by the persistence of structures of slavery. There is the death penalty and what Brian Stevens calls the other death penalty, life without possibility of parole, uh, which is often represented as an alternative to the death penalty. Instead of being killed uh, by uh, chemicals, uh, the sentence is to die a slow death in prison. It is certainly true that men constitute the vast majority of people in prison throughout the country and throughout the world, but women and girls are affected by the phenomenon of over-incarceration. First of all, women still constitute the fastest growing sector of the imprisoned population. No. And then women suffer the collateral consequences of over-incarceration. No. Um, they are the ones who visit. They are the ones who pay the uh, uh, overwhelmingly expensive cost of collect phone calls, um, et cetera, et cetera. Although many scholars and activists have insisted over the decades that race is always gendered and gender is race, there's still the tendency to consider race as gender neutral and gender as race neutral. And so the Black Lives Matter campaign has had to insist that black lives be considered in their various specificities. So if, if one makes the claim that black lives matter, one has to agree that black women's lives matter, that black girls' lives matter, black lesbians, black gay men, black trans women, black differently abled people, etc. cetera. Uh, the police killing of Miriam Carey in Washington emphasized that women too are targets of racist state violence. Uh, um, the video footage to which I referred uh, of the school resource officer taking down a schoolgirl who was apparently subjected to discipline because she used her cell phone in class is further evidence of the way race and gender intersect in very violent ways. The very low level of intelligence with respect to the way racism functions in our society was exhibited by the sheriff of Richland County who indicated that he had fired the school resource officer for attacking the girl in such a brutal manner. But at the same time, he indicated that he didn't think racism had anything to do with it uh, because the officer had a black girlfriend. <laughs> in any event, many people have asked me whether I'm excited after that finally, after decades of failure to acknowledge the prison crisis, Suddenly, it seems, everyone is turning their attention in the direction of mass incarceration. Uh, and I must say that um, the historical-minded people uh, that John Hope Franklin wanted to see, uh, uh, that a, a historical-minded people would recognize uh, that we cannot simply start with current events. If one focuses primarily or only on the present, we require the mistaken impression that what is is shaped purely by immediate circumstances and that what happened in the past is securely locked away from the present. Therefore, one might uh, entertain the mistaken assumption that all one has to do is to engage in a process of decarceration. All that is necessary is to reduce the numbers of, of people um, in prison. And of course, abolitionists have, have always called for decarceration. Um, but at the same time, we've suggested that 
racial, what one might call racialized over incarceration is the linchpin of a prison industrial complex that represents the increasing profitability of punishment, a central strategy of global capitalism, a strategy of managing bodies of color and immigrant bodies and bodies perceived to be immigrants, no matter how many generations they may have lived in North America or Europe. The prison industrial complex, as we pointed out, produces these bodies as surplus bodies, as disposable populations, put them in a vast garbage bin, add sophisticated electronic technology to control them and let them languish there. In the meantime, create the ideological illusion that the surrounding society is safer and more free because the dangerous black people are locked up. In the meantime, In the meantime, corporations profit, poor communities suffer, public education suffers because it is not profitable according to corporate measures, public health care suffers. If punishment can be profitable, then health care should be profitable as well. Now, it should also be pointed out that countries like Israel use the carceral technologies developed by the prison industrial complex, not only to control the thousands of Palestinians behind bars, but also to control the everyday lives of Palestinians who live on the West Bank, and Gaza, and inside Israel. These carceral technologies are the material constructs of Israeli apartheid. But I don't want to leave you with a sense of the endless repetition of history. I don't want to leave you feeling frustrated about our inability to bring about change precisely because of the complexity of the processes that have produced the problems. From the very history of slavery, neo-slavery, the reconfigured slavery of the prison industrial complex, we learn that resistance is not only possible, but that it is the only legitimate response to these systems and apparatuses of unfreedom. Just as we affirm connections between slavery and the prison industrial complex, we also emphasize the link between anti-slavery abolitionism and anti-prison abolitionism. We learn a great deal about what might be on our social and political agendas today by looking at what was not achieved in the aftermath of slavery. The abolition democracy that still remains to be established today. What those who advocated an abolition democracy in the 19th century understood was the interconnectedness between the negative aspect of abolition, the elimination of the institution of slavery, and the positive aspect of abolition, the creation of a new democracy with new institutions that might have made it possible for former slaves and today for racially marginalized people to participate on a level of equality in the institutions of economic, social, and political life. And so this means that democracy as we know it would have to be transformed. It would not be assimilation into the existing democracy, but rather the creation of, of a new democracy. What anti-prison abolition attempts to accomplish is what anti-slavery abolition fail to achieve. It takes up not only issues of over-incarceration and the way race and gender structure the prison industrial complex, but also addresses the unresolved issues of jobs and education and healthcare that have been looming over our society since the putative abolition of slavery. 
And therefore, as we attempt to formulate demands that respond to current conditions. Uh, we, we call for the demilitarization of the police, uh, which was one of the very important um, ideas that came out of the Ferguson protests. Uh, but I think we should go further than demilitarizing the police. Uh, uh, the Ferguson police very quickly understood that they had to shed their military garb and get rid of, hide their uh, um, uh, tanks and, 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 and technology, uh, particularly when um, they could be visually captured uh, uh, through the media or social media. But I think we have to go further than demilitarization. And this might be the period to make an impossible demand. Yeah. We might call for the disarming of the police. Yeah. I mean, of course, uh, there are those who call for gun control but they don't think about controlling the guns that are in the hands of the police. Uh, and if we got rid of the 300 million guns that uh, uh, are in the hands of civilians in this country, then the police could easily be disarmed as well. And as a matter of fact, we might think about the abolition of the institution of the police as we know it. It occurs to me sometimes that, that, that we frame our demands in the context of what we think is achievable, is possible at the moment. And as a result, we lose sight of the future possibilities of history. And so sometimes, uh, as Franklin pointed out, we have to recognize that the fulfillment of those demands may not be on the immediate agenda. Uh, uh, that it may not happen in our own lifetimes. Uh, but if we do not make the demand, uh, how then will it be possible for future generations to take it up and perhaps uh, 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 move towards its, uh, their fruition. And so those of us who have been saying that we should abolish imprisonment as the dominant mode of punishment as a way of continuing the struggle to abolish slavery are now saying abolish the institution of the police as the primary institution guaranteeing security in order to make way for new notions of security. A security based on health, available health care and education that is no longer commodified. Uh, uh, we've reached the point where we for, forget that uh, there was a time when uh, people did not have to uh, be in possession of such huge amounts of money in order to get an education. My father went to St. Augustine's right here in the area. He had absolutely no money at all. He was supported by the Episcopal Church. Uh, but I'm not suggesting that we return to the past, but I am suggesting that we learn uh, uh, lessons uh, for uh, the future. And if we effectively call for demilitarization of the police and disarming the police and abolition of the police and abolition of imprisonment as the dominant mode of punishment, this would be only the beginning of a much longer struggle to reimagine, reinvent, and recreate our societies. Thank you very much. Thank you.